What's going on, everybody? My name is Adam. I am head coach and founder of Odyssey Strength, and this is the Odyssey podcast. So I am joined by my co-host, Connor Campbell. Connor, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Connor Campbell, and I'm an assistant coach with Odyssey Strength. Boom. So um, this is this is not our first attempt at a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's something we both wanted to do for quite a, a few years now right it's not been like we didn't come up with this idea last week like we've been wanting to do this for a long while um so we're finally pulling the trigger we're committing we're gonna do this on a on a weekly basis um the idea the mission statement so to speak is um just a, a place for us to flesh out our thoughts in a in a long form manner you know you have instagram where we're oftentimes uh and, and other social medias where oftentimes uh, thoughts and viewpoints are condensed and condensed to the point where they're, you know, misunderstood or taken out of context or whatever. Um, so we want this to be a place where we can fully flesh out our thoughts and hopefully in time get other people on, other coaches on, other people within the world of powerlifting, maybe people outside of the world of powerlifting um, to to come on and, and do the same thing. So, so yeah, that's us. We're here. We're going to talk about stuff. <laughs> I'm really glad actually that we're doing it as well and more of a, a, a long form platform because as, as we spoke about during the week on Instagram, I've been trying to, uh, stories is such a pain in the ass to try and flesh out these thoughts mm -hmm. because these, it, it, it leaves no room for, for nuance and that you have to say something simple or you nearly have to dumb it down to a degree where it's not even right anymore to fit it on this thing, you know, which is. A pain. We talked about um, we talked about an analogy you put up, and uh, the analogy was fantastic. It was it was about the the rabbits. You, you know? hate that analogy. <laughs> the analogy was good. So <laughs> explain explain the premise, and then I'll explain our interaction about the analogy. So the idea was somebody had had um, I put up a question that was about I was ranting about shit, and I was like, "What what are you ranting about? What what's pissing you off at the minute?" And somebody said essentially that you can't chase multiple fitness characteristics at the same time you can't develop these at the same time and that you can't be great at everything that you can't be super big strong fast and great at a load of different skill based challenges at the same time i go yeah that's unfortunately the way it is and there's a lot of i suppose challenges with concurrent training and it's it seems that people think yeah you absolutely can do it or no no way at all you can do it. And so I said that there is certain things that may fit well together, whether it's in the same block or alternating blocks, whatever way you want to skin it. And I kind of put it in a way that means you can, if you chase two rabbits at the same time, you'll catch neither, which is a pretty common expression. But I put it in terms of if you think of muscular strength and muscular hypertrophy, that these two rabbits are going in the same direction up to a point and then they start to veer off you know and it's i said this works especially well when you say that catching the rabbit isn't the goal it's just to get <laughs> as close to it as possible for as long as possible and the idea just before you shed that's the idea behind that is a lot of people just want to get as big as possible or as strong as possible that they might not be this distinct goal especially with hypertrophy now, of course, that falls apart when you say, I want to squat 300 kilos, because that's a rabbit that you can catch, you know? Look, it has its, <laughs> it has its so, fucking so downsides. Just like right there on the story, Connor spent two minutes <laughs> trying to explain this, this analogy. It's called and, context. Uh, Instagram stories are not the place for, for that, you know? So I am also glad that we're here, we're doing this, we're in a position where you can monologue for three minutes to explain the relevance of your, <laughs> of your the your irrelevance analogy. maybe of your maybe. rabbit stories i i came in with a with a counter not a counter uh, an edit i suppose to that analogy because i think it is a, good a analogy. correction a correction we'll say um where and a simplification right would you agree yes yes it was very simple of you <laughs> um so what I think is, is a better analogy is, you know, you've got, it's, it's fine to chase two rabbits. So be it um, muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy, if the rabbits are running in exactly the same direction. But when those rabbits start to veer off, which muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy do, 
you better pick one or you're going to catch neither. Yeah. So that took 95 seconds less to explain. <laughs> because I set the scene for it. That's true. That's true. Context. Without your context. Without your context. That's, that's true. Any, what did you want to talk about? What, what are we here to, to discuss? Do you have any topics in Today, mind? Today, no, like it's, there's not a whole lot going on in terms of powerlifting. Like I saw um, Chaos Gym, the, tr- the gym that I train in, put up a story. It was like, we would talk about powerlifting, but there's there not a whole no. lot going on right now. <laughs> um, and it's, it's tough. Like there's a few meets going on in different countries and you're kind of seeing big things happen. Like John Hack is, is going to compete again in a week and a half with hybrid strength performance in Miami. And he's just going to do stupid things. I think he's going to pull over 400. I think he will be the lightest person to ever put. Or will he? I don't he know. He will be lighter than... Who, who is the current lightest? Is it Christoph? I don't know. Like, did... I, I can't even... I don't even know his real name now. The Sith Lord Ren that fucking King of the Lifts is posting the whole time. I actually don't even know his name. But he's <laughs> lifting in his apartment... He's a 74 and 83 and he's pulling stupid things. I don't know if he's pulled 400, but I think John Hack is, will definitely do it and have a monster squat and bench too. Mm-hmm. It's you nuts know? actually. And he think he's, could be the greatest powerlifter of all time. Oh, without doubt, without doubt. Um, man, it's mad to think, you watched him versus Brett Gibbs live, right? Back in the day. Yeah. That was, that was mm-hmm. like... Maybe the best flight of powerlifting at IPF Worlds. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. One of the best ever, right? It was it mm. was like the the quickest. Like powerlifting is not an easy sport to watch by any means. And that's a problem maybe we could talk about and get into. Um, but that flight flew. And I'd actually, I, I'm pretty sure I've rewatched it a couple of times since. Because that Me was too. just an unbelievable session of powerlifting. Like right down to the last pull where Brett had something was it 332 or something to the knees looked like he was about to lock it out and he dropped it to win mm. unbelievable i think it was something something like that yeah it was bananas jp couch he just threw on whatever he had to throw on we've all been That's there. what you gotta do <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, you love that when it's just right down to the wire because it is such a it is an individual sport and it's when the emphasis is that you kind of just go there to do your own thing and to break your own records when there is that competitiveness there it's amazing it's yeah. fucking unreal it's yeah. just nuts now to see him thrown around 260 in training fairly handy you know for a bench press like yeah I it was think, fun. like he I, should I, be dead I, I, think his, I think his opening squat was 260 at that competition you know it's just it's insane like it's absolutely nuts Hell i of think a drug. i i can't remember if it was some a uh, lifter i know or a commentator, I think it might have been Lapidat, called him the chemist <laughs> on a live stream. And I didn't know what to make of that at the time. Uh, but I guess he's kind of out in the open with it now, right? Well, he is a master's in organic chemistry. There you go. He literally yeah. is a chemist. <laughs> That's his job. Yeah. That that answers that answers so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mad as well, because he's such a an odd character. So I suppose he fits right in with, with chemists. A large part of my degree is analytical chemistry, and well, I haven't met anyone like him yet. But <laughs> they're a, a special kind of people, <laughs> you know. The just on really fun to watch, like powerlifting flights. Uh, Luke Richardson and Pavlo Nakanechny. Something yeah. was. Unreal, especially in the super heavyweights, because that's not something that you see mm-hmm. too often because we're too used to Ray Williams coming in and just destroying it. But I think this was Euros. Was it Euros or IPF Worlds 2018 or 2019? It was Euros 2019, I believe. Just that was down to the last pull as well. Mm-hmm. I think it ended on a similar note. Pablo just couldn't hold on to it with grip. Mm-hmm. That, and I think it was. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was it Barry Piggott, Bryce Lewis, and was it Garp Evans? Garp Evans, yeah. Just tit for tat, world record, world record. 
was that great. kind of stuff really makes it fun to watch and it's not easy like it's we're both heavily involved and even if you don't have somebody there with you that you know or that you're coaching it's a long day <laughs> and i don't know if i'm the best spectator in the world but it's it's rough to, to just sit there and be like oh i don't think i've ever years. just spectated a meet i'm trying to think i might have um <laughs> actually there's one meet i think it was four years ago the other day it was a city gym beginner meet i uh, remember they did like in-house meets for a while mm. um novice meets they were, they were calling them and uh, my sister competed at that years ago but uh, she had a different coach at the time but i could not help myself i couldn't sit in the in the spectator area like i probably against uh you know well you're one of these guys you just hop (laughs) into the warm-up room for the crack and prance around i couldn't sit back there i had to go and uh you know butt in on the coaching poor jackie in a pair of uh, jeans (laughs) yeah (laughs) um but it is a long day i don't know if i necessarily could sit through um a, a full day of powerlifting if i didn't know what was involved you know and mm. actually credit to credit to abs and credit to jay like the competitions they've been putting on in the last couple of years are phenomenal nationals this year was like unlike any competition i've ever been to and e- unlike a uh, international competition that i've been to like it was just something else the, the buzz around the place that was 100 percent down to the like incredible atmosphere created by the fucking lasers and you know all the mad shit that was around the place like i think it was it, it was helped and and you know it did set the set the scene but the the quality of the lifters i think has just blown up and that really and because i suppose like we could argue about what the social media has been good or bad but it's definitely been good for powerlifting and that we we kind of follow everyone and see oh, Andy did this in training or Ken did this in training or Dami did this and you're like, what the fuck? Who's going to win? And that kind of thing builds a lot of suspense. It builds a lot of hype, which makes it to game day and you can feel it, which which matters so much. And even if you weren't coaching, like that's a meet that you could sit and watch and you'd be freaking out. You're like, who's going to do what? Or what's he going to do? This is like a last ditch attempt. As you said, you put on what you need to put on. And that's mm. insane because... Well, I, I suppose it's especially because you know what it's like to put on a third attempt you're not too confident of. And it's fucking scary. And everyone else kind of feels it too. They're like, what's going to happen? <laughs> it's it was, fantastic. Uh, an example of that was Izzy's third pull, mm. 320.5. Um, I, was, I was confident he's a strong dude, but like the thing with Izzy is you just don't know what he's got. <laughs> like, you don't, like he'll squat 200 for a couple of reps one week and the next week he like randomly did a 300 double you know like the dude is just one of those athletes where you kind of just have to like give him guide him you know uh usher him along the right path and uh just let him let him go let him do his own thing if he decides one day he's gonna do a fucking 320 kilo single then you know <laughs> there's kind of i i heard was this uh mike just here and jordan feigenbaum talking on the i think it was the rts podcast about there has to be some criteria for which that if you're feeling good on a day and you feel like you could really push your your best and, and hit a best there's a lot to be said for just going for it you know because mm-hmm. like the whole thing with even the bottoms up programming that we do is that we're trying to reduce the, the or improve the signal to noise ratio as much as possible and figure out what conditions lead to this peak performance. And of course, there's so much, like we're never going to know for certain. We can discern between what's probably not too accurate and what's probably maybe a little bit closer to the truth at that point in time, because it's a dynamic process. But am I, am I dead? My camera's gone. Your camera, there, <laughs> there we go. We go. Um, but he said there has to be this criteria especially with a, an experienced lifter because we both know that some lad who's just started be like yeah i feel class i could max out right today they don't need any encouragement but there's a lot to be said for the physical and mental benefits of pushing big weights when you can do it you know and i think that's something that's yet to be figured out of course mm-hmm. because it's too easy to say yeah i could do it right now i want to hit a pr because we all want to hit prs every day definitely i think um 
yeah it, it's um like anything with the bottoms up structure it comes with a lot of time and experience working with a particular individual to, to give them to like I, I wouldn't say to someone i'm just i've just started working with especially if they're you know a newer or a younger lifter not a not, not as mature a lifter i wouldn't say like if you feel amazing go for it max out because like if you think back to you know when you were a 18 year old 17 18 year old i had like every training day i felt amazing every training day it was like my best day ever you know yeah. <laughs> um so i would be very cautious but like um someone like andrew rowe we're, we're currently in a position where he's back training properly he's you know over this period of of being injured and he's confident again so if andrew well, currently andrew's programming is like five reps at rp7 pretty much on the squad and deadlift let's say but next week which is the final week of his block uh we didn't even have to say it but like if he feels great he's going for something big like you know he's going for like a, a five rep max you know um because he has so much momentum behind him and it's such a it's a nuanced situation. It's not as straightforward as like hit five, hit your RP, hit five at seven or else bad, you know, it's far more nuanced than that. And, um, and there is definitely huge benefit to, to certain individuals just going for something if they feel like they could on a particular day, because that might, you might not have an opportunity to break a mental barrier, which is a highly uh, underrated thing Mm. for, for another few months. You know, so you could be delaying a certain amount of, uh, at the very least, a mental progression, uh, three months longer than than you might have to. You know, so yeah, definitely. Especially after such a long period of time, where you're kind of on the sidelines due to niggles, pains, and aches and injuries, to it, to be presented with this opportunity is pretty crazy. You know, and I'm, I'm sure you both thought at the start of this block to be moving and training without pain would be fantastic mm-hmm. but he's hitting um, prs it's insane like but yeah i suppose again it comes down to experience but i like i kind of knew something big was coming from andrew this block because it's, it's it's andrew you know mm. <laughs> he's just one of the another one of those lifters where like um you could throw anything at him like and uh i don't think i've ever given andrew something that he hasn't improved on you know i don't <laughs> think i don't think he's ever um had a real negative training block bar the you know injury and whatnot yeah i mean the 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 deductor was probably a bad one (laughs) yeah maybe you know that old joke's like oh there's no such thing as a bad training session except for that one where you tore your pec that was pretty shit (laughs) true true he's Um, one of these lifters that if like when he's in that moment i don't think it matters what's on the bar he it's getting it's getting done yep and uh sometimes it can be Sometimes a whole training block or with, with someone like with an individual like Andrew is devised simply to inspire that that uh, confidence in him, to inspire that that feeling where he feels like he can just take something on, you know, mm. because time and time and time again, he's, he's proved that if he feels like he can take something on, it's because he can, you know, <laughs> he's, he's never uh, he's never taken something on and, and failed it, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely something to be said for that. Something I wanted to talk about is, um, is injuries in, in powerlifting and in sport in general, Mm. Uh, but particularly in powerlifting, uh, some, I guess the way I want to start it off is by, by asking you, what do you make of the way injury is viewed within the, the realm of powerlifting? Now you know I'm I'm not a very opinionated person, Adam. Me neither. <laughs> um, I don't know. I I definitely have this false view of what it's like at the minute, because in a lot of reading and a lot of study I've done in the last let's even more than a year, the last eighteen months, let's say it's gone into deep into the biopsychosocial model of pain, which very kind of simply put is that with any pain experience, there is a certain degree of biological, psychological, and social factors to consider. And I think that is a very big implication in how we manage the pain experience, you know, 
it, it's tough to give an overall like this is my assessment of the situation as is powerlifting is inherently very low risk for injuries which sounds crazy when you say it because you're putting these huge weights on the bar and, and especially if you see somebody like, somebody like me training where i go purple my eyes fucking start popping out veins that i didn't know i had were just starting to pop out on 70 kilos <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like the safest sport but because it's so one-dimensional because the load is self-selected because it's so low velocity the injury rate for powerlifting is it's it's two to four acute injuries per thousand hours of training which is crazy like if you look at certain field sports it's up at 40 and 50 you know but also you you have to consider that that might involve a large man running into you with bad intentions mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. but it, yeah it's it's tough to give an assessment of what it's like i think people are a bit too cautious this is what i was trying to kind of touch on i suppose i'm also asking um within the from from like a, a social standpoint uh like like what do you think the general view of injury you know amongst the people who are involved in powerlifting is and what do you make of that i'm still struggling to answer this i i yeah i think people are very concerned and conservative and i think they catastrophize if that's the right way to say it immediately like i think if there is a niggle a pain or an ache it's like oh stop mm -hmm. what's wrong you're hurt you okay how's your back is your back okay just mind your back because especially with non-specific lower back pain there's a huge 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 sociological and psychological factor contributing to, to contributing to it and i'm opinionated about this because it affects 85 percent of people and it, as you and i both know it it is unbelievably debilitating and it has a huge huge potential to impact your life in a negative way so i think if people kind of got out of this very reductionist and me mechanistic view of it which would be a very biomedical approach that hurt means harm harm this tissue that's a problem I think if we got ourselves out of that and considered the broader implications of the pain experience on your, I suppose, on your mental health, to, for want of a better term, I think we would find ourselves able to overcome niggles, pains and aches a lot easier. And it would significantly reduce the impact of these things on our training and on our fucking health in general. You know, would you agree with that? Totally, totally. Like exactly my view. <laughs> It's um, tough to, to kind of tease it out mm -hmm. exactly, you know, and, and as you know, I have a tendency to, to ramble and go off on tangents and do this and do this. But, but I think overall that is, that is it. Like people are stuck in this very old way of looking at things and it's problematic, you know, and the, the thing that's, that's often said is, well, it's, it's worked so far. Why even talk about it? It's like, yeah, a lot of people get fucked over by it. Like how many, how many times have you heard somebody say, I can't do that. I have a bad back. It's like in my day job, like what my day is job is, you know, working with normal people. So that's, uh, like you said, in probably eighty percent of people who come into the gym for the first time, they've experienced some sort of pain and they're very hesitant of doing some exercise that some professional along the line has told them is contributing to that to that pain. Mm. So a huge amount of people. It's depressing. It really is. Mm -hmm. And if if you were to consider the implications of non-specific lower back pain on not even people's lives, but their, their income and their expenditure and how they go and see different professionals, how they take these medications, how they, excuse me, how they limit their activities. It's huge. And then if you were to think of the burden on the healthcare system of that, unnecessarily so, it's massive and i think it is important to address and important to to dig down deep into it and it's it's tough to kind of reconcile you know because these kind of mechanistic answers are very satisfying because they kind of feel intrinsically like they make sense you know like oh your body is a machine this part is sore well you fucked it up in some way it's like mm, maybe not we're we're extremely complex individuals this creatures is, i suppose that is kind of the the, what I was looking to talk about specifically is the kind of uh, 
input output view uh, that there is in in powerlifting on on all things really on on you know training on injury on on everything like you know input being a set of training you know training stimulus output equals injury well that training stimulus is bad you know mm. no <laughs> uh, input be in input being uh, you know stretching to injured tissue output you felt better stretching to injured tissue fixes injury no <laughs> you know you're pushing my buttons big time here <laughs> with these <laughs> hypothetical questions i have this I suppose, serious bone to pick with stretching <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave that for another day but yeah um i suppose the reason i ask is because we're powerlifting coaches you know so we deal with injury and and we deal with injured injured athletes and we have certain approaches um that might seem sometimes i feel like it, it could it can come across that um we're not concerned mm. because we're not taking a we're not looking for i suppose a, a very very active and direct approach that that um that an individual might expect you know sometimes yeah, sometimes particularly with things like uh, like obviously our first advice will always be t to um outsource you know to recommend a, a professional who's who's you know trained and very well equipped to deal with the specific thing you know uh so i'm talking about you know not a chiropractor a Go chartered on, physiotherapist <laughs> <laughs> um but beyond that it's usually you know load management yes you just gotta rest you know we're just gonna rest you we're gonna see how it goes I might prescribe some very basic things. I've seen good success from, you know, a bit of core work, you know, stuff that's inoffensive and uh, usually very small interventions. You I'm know? offended from what you said. <laughs> Red, no, I'm not, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. There's, yes, there is, there is small interventions that we can do. And in terms of overuse injuries, like muscular strains or what, whatever you want to call it, yeah, management of dosage and load of training is absolutely. And I, I, I hate to be pedantic, although you wouldn't think it from how much of my time I spend <laughs> being pedantic, but um, saying that, yeah, we're just going to rest it is problematic, you know? Mm -hmm. And in terms of tendinopathy, which is one of the most common, it's it's a blanket term for any sort of tendon issue. It's It's one of the most common issues in powerlifting rest is not the answer the tendons respond to the stress that's put upon them if you don't put any stress on them if you rest completely they won't respond they won't adapt which is what you want them to do so you'll find that somebody and i, I had a client who was suffering with medial epicondylitis for ages he was like there's like glass going into my elbows when i'm benching and at the time I was like, fucking rest. I don't know. <laughs> like I'm, I was like, see someone about it. Like I, I, I couldn't answer these questions. And in part, this case is kind of why I started reading about it. But he took a break off of benching for a while. I went back to it maybe a month later. And it's like, this pain is still here. What the fuck is going on? So it's only in hindsight. And I still do talk to him. He's a good friend of mine. Though he said, right. Doing nothing probably wasn't a good, good idea. Like we should do something. And operate within a tolerable level of pain and chase an adaptation rather than avoiding stress. Sorry. I, <laughs> That's fine. No, I suppose you triggered me when I, I should have been more, uh, I should have been more accurate in, in how I explained it. So that is what's your microaggressions, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when I say rest, um, that, that is what I mean most of the time, right? There are still cases where rest is, is the answer, you know, Absolutely. Um, but, most of the time we're going to by rest i mean not give you a you know a single at rp 9.5 you know mm. i might uh, i might reduce the the load or reduce the rp but but generally keep you moving in a, a as you mentioned a tolerable through a tolerable level of um, of pain mm. um, that is always the goal but um, yeah I, that 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 is just something i want to talk about because i feel oftentimes the uh, the answer to, to injury is not as cut and dry as uh, as people try to make it out to be. You know, oftentimes an injury is not down to a specific 
um, training stimulus that, that you were being exposed to at that time, you know, could have been something that had been brewing for, for years, you know? Mm. Yeah. This, this idea that it's either the cause of an injury or what you do to, to, to remedy it can get so totally misconstrued. It's absolutely crazy. It's like, Oh, my chest came forward when I squatted and I got this pain in my lower back. Like I must avoid this chest fall pattern in my squat and stay as upright as possible. It's like, well, no, it's, it's that at some level you had been squatting completely upright. And then maybe, yes, something happened that you came forward a little bit. Potentially your erectors got loaded far more than they had been in the past. Potentially you have this idea that squatting with a leaned forward torso is problematic. Pain can be viewed as an alarm system. And so these alarm bells went off. It's like fucking stop this right now. And you may get a, a pain experience in your lower back that's non-specific, non-specific meaning that you can't really diagnose it, or it's not specific to one region, or it may not appear on medical imaging. That doesn't mean that squatting leaned over is a problem. It means that your interpretation of these signals is problematic. You know, that's maybe one example of how it can be, how the cause of a pain experience can be misconstrued. And in terms of remedying this, the amount of, oh, I just need a good deep tissue massage. I just need this crazy manual therapy. And I know Adam, at some level, you're thinking, Connor, remember when you used to get cupping done and you thought it was class and you thought it was the <laughs> dog's box. I mean, before, before we go any further, I, uh, I have training in manual therapy that I detest having. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Snake oil salesman. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's because something feels good doesn't mean that it's remedying your issue because you don't have the pain experience anymore as a result of whatever recovery modality that you use. That doesn't mean it works, you know? And if it's a once off and it works, fantastic, great, good for you, go train. But the problem is when you reinforce this reductionist attitude and you think that things are simpler than they are and that you grow this dependency on some form of manual therapy, that's a big problem. That's a bigger problem than spending the time that it takes to dig deeper into why you're feeling this pain. Does that make sense? hundred percent. Makes, makes a ton of sense. Um, yeah, I think the... <laughs> The biopsychosocial model is something that uh, every powerlifting coach should should be aware of. You know, absolutely. How how pain is not uh, simply like medical. You know, <laughs> there's there's it's a multivariate thing. How uh, mm. there, there's many factors that that influence pain as an experience, and pain is an, an experience. You know, and oftentimes it's it's forgotten that this uh, this uh, inf influenceable. What's the word? Um, I have no you know idea. what I'm trying to say. It's not influential. <laughs> uh, impressionable. Impressionable. This impressionable young lifter um, who looks up to you, coach of, you know, successful lifters, um, will hear you saying, yeah, that you're, you're leaning over in your squat. It's hurting your back. And boom, forever, forever, this person thinks leaning over in their squat will hurt their back. And not the very the very idea of leaning over in the squat will hurt their back, you know. It's uh, I suppose it's part of the the wider problem in the sport of powerlifting that there is no training to be a coach, you know. Mm. Um, but again, that's a different conversation because that's a whole other. There's no money in the sport either. So <laughs> but. the one thing I, I want to, because this is always something that I'm paranoid of, is that when I start talking about pain or when I start talking about injury, the thing is like, you're not a fucking healthcare professional. And I'm acutely aware of that. It's like, yes, we're not healthcare professionals, but pain is inherent to the human condition and nobody is without it pays big time to, for you, you to be aware of it yourself and to be aware of it for the people that you coach and the people that you come into contact with. Adam and I are both powerlifting coaches and we're both personal trainers. We work in very close contact with the general population. And as I said earlier on, 85% of people will, ex will experience some degree of lower back pain, non-specific lower back pain in their life. It fucking pays 
not financially because it's <laughs> you won't get rich being a powerlifting coach, but it pays it in terms of your ability to help people to be aware of how complicated the pain experience is, you know, even in terms of reassuring somebody, you know, I, I worked in a semi-private gym in 2019 and we were doing trapper deadlifts, which was great. This one lady, she was very well used to it, needed a bit of encouragement on to go a little bit heavier as the program kind of asked for. And she'd been super conservative. So I was like, come on, we'll, we'll go up a little bit of weight. And she did three reps, grand, locked out the fourth, up, oh, dropped the bar. And I was like, what? What's going on? And she's like, oh, my back, I hurt my back, I hurt my back. And I was like, stop, come on, let's go for a walk. And she was freaking out. I was like, for fuck's sake, come on, come for a walk. And we walked around this clubhouse. It was in a, it was in a GAA. And at the end of it, she was like, actually, I feel fine. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, if I had told you to, oh, sit down, you all right? And, and doted on you, this would just reinforce that, fuck, something has gone wrong. It's, it's that kind of reason or that kind of situation that calls for this understanding of hurt doesn't really mean harm, you know? And that's why we should know about it. And that's why I think it's worth talking about. Not that we're, not that I think I'm a fucking doctor, not that Alan thinks he's a doctor or a physiotherapist or that I think I'm a physiotherapist. It's that this is important to know about, you know, rant over. Absolutely. It's a, no, it's a cool example. I, one example to just throw onto the top of that. That's quite interesting. Um, well, there, there's many examples, but the, the kind of one that sticks to mind um, is I, I, again, won't name names, but I, I was at a place before and uh, a fellow was having his back cracked the most, uh, obviously the most of the most effective of uh <laughs> of spinal decompression practices uh, <laughs> but he was having his back just manually cracked which like look it feels fine you know? feels it great feels, to be honest if, yeah exactly and like sometimes it's nice and you know if you enjoy it great you know um but he was having his back cracked and he'd never had his back cracked before he had never even experienced a crack before oh, I, I i learned after he had his back cracked anyway and this fella started screaming screaming i shouldn't laugh in, uh, in pain like in pain you know the guy was in pain it might not have registered his pain for you or i but this guy was in pain so much so that he was screaming uh, and crying and everything and uh five minutes later everything kind of wore down and he was like i feel great <laughs> you know? maybe he just needed a good cry <laughs> maybe he did maybe, maybe he's just dealing was. with some shit <laughs> <laughs> That's actually raises a pr pretty, it's, it's one way you put it there that raises a pretty interesting topic. And we've both dealt with people who any kind of stimulus at all is interpreted as pain. And it is so unbelievably dangerous, you know, and it, it can come often after a period of time where somebody has, yes, a legitimate pain experience. You know, that's not to say that there is an illegitimate, illegitimate fucking pain experience. It's entirely subjective. But after somebody maybe has been hyper aware over a period of time and you try and reintroduce movement or exercise to some degree and everything is up, I just, I just, oh, me. And you're like, what, what's, what is going on? It's like, oh, I just, I'm going to take it easy there now. It's like, you, you're warming up with the bar, but you're like, okay, fine. Look, we'll, we'll see what's happening the next day. But it's anything that seems to be interpreted as pain. And it's a huge, huge problem. I think, um, I think something, something that I'm personally quite careful of, and it's, it's something I've never spoken to even you about is, um, like, I don't think it's my job specifically to try and improve, um, someone's understanding of pain, you know, of, uh, of the pain experience necessarily. Like, you know, someone thinks, uh, leaning over in the squat is going to hurt their back, you know? I don't think it's on me to improve how they uh, feel about that for a better, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, but it's definitely on me to not make it worse, you know? So I'm always very conscious on, uh, about the things that I say so as to not have, uh, a negative effect on their, their understanding of, of movement and, and of pain and whatnot. Um, yeah, 
I kind of, I kind of, why, why do you feel that way? Why do you feel like it's not your responsibility you to improve somebody's understanding of this? You see, Connor, I was going to explain with a very nice example. And as I was explaining, I forgot. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to highlight that. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do think one of the main people I follow and that I've, I've kind of looked towards for education on this kind of thing is Barbara Madison, of course. I, I harp on them like it's my fucking job. Um, but one of the the main pathways that they start to kind of remedy somebody's pain experience is education about their understanding of the pain experience, what it is and what it isn't, you know, which is far easier said than done, but it's, it's definitely something that is employed. And I think, again, we're not healthcare professionals, so we need to be very, very careful. I don't think opening the door up for discussion is a problem. And I think that's something that we can do. If we, if, if Adam came to me, Adam is a client of mine, if he came to me and was like, my elbow is going to fall off on a bench, like it just hurts so much. There's no harm in me asking, why do you think that is, you know, and trying to just open up things for discussion to see what his understanding of this pain experience is, you know, because this is entirely individual to you. I don't know anything about it. Nobody can tell you that you're pain isn't real you know the funny thing that i always hear when i talk about the biopsychosocial model of pain which is always on nights out with pints like i always fucking go on about it (laughs) and the thing that i always hear is like oh you're just telling me my pain's all in my head it's like well it's all all in your head so fuck you (laughs) but opening the door for discussion and trying to get you thinking about what's actually going on helps big time for sure for sure. I actually, um, I remembered while you were talking, while you were monologuing there. Um, <laughs> I once dealt with an individual and this was kind of, um, this would have been earlier on in my coaching career uh, when I you know, had less experience and, and less tools to deal with this specific uh, instance. But he would interpret, <laughs> I mean, it is painful, like for me at least. Um, he would interpret the increased tension in your body as load increases on the bar and as your brace, uh, <laughs> you know, has to, has to, to match it. He would interpret that sensation, that feeling as pain, you know, and it was super problematic because I didn't know what he was talking about. And I couldn't understand like, dude, you're moving perfectly. You know, you, you, there's no, there's nothing, um, you, you don't experience pain in, in any other uh, aspect of life you know uh, i couldn't wrap my head around it at the time i suppose i didn't really try to accommodate that you know i was just like well this fella's nuts you know <laughs> <laughs> um when in reality and it's something that we do now you know we we look to structure our training around the individual right whereas at the time i wasn't uh, running a, like a, a bottoms up approach i wasn't necessarily concerned with I was concerned with the, the, the end goal, right? Which was a competition, which was coming up in not so long. I wasn't necessarily as concerned about um, creating a training structure that suited this individual and, and all of the quirks that this individual came with, such as their specific um, understanding of, of their, the pain they were experiencing and just their, their own pain experience, right? Which is kind of why, why I'm, I'm saying like, in that instance, it's not on me to be like, you're wrong, stop. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> in that instance, like now I would have looked to devise tactics and methods that would have tried to, as we mentioned before, make that pain experience tolerable while um, working towards the goal, which was the competition, you know, and now that I think about it, it's actually the first time I've thought about it since then. I have loads of ideas, you know loads of ways we could have manipulated, you know, rep schemes and RPE and, and whatnot to try and present him with a, with a training stimulus that at the time, at that specific, you know, at that specific time that would have been tolerable while opening up the conversation and working on it. But that is, as you mentioned, making things a conversation is, is very, very important in the coach athlete relationship across the board, whether we're talking about pain or whether we're talking about 
exercise selection or, or whatever. It's it's again not as cut and dry as pause squats good, conventional deadlifts good. You should always do this, you know. It's um it's it's far more complicated than that. Hey everyone. Unfortunately we ran into some technical difficulties that cut the podcast short. But as we said, that's our first of hopefully many podcasts to come. We really enjoyed doing it. If you've got any questions or anything for us, just drop a comment in the comment section below. Um, I hope everyone is safe, healthy, happy, and we're looking forward to bringing you more. Cheers, guys.